You know, one of the great gifts of the Bible is how brutally honest it is about our condition as fallen human beings. Now, initially, they might not sound like a gift, but I promise you it is. It's a mark of God's grace to not let us deceive ourselves into thinking that we are something that we are not, that we're, we're better than we are. Rather, God has given us scripture as a mirror, James chapter 1, verse 23 says, to allow us to see ourselves in our own brokenness and the need for salvation from that brokenness. And in doing so, it leads us to cling with joy to the gospel of Jesus Christ, where that salvation is found. And therein is the grace. Therein lies the gift. Because our, our awareness of our need for salvation only increases the joy that we feel when we see that salvation offered in Christ. The more we are aware of our need, the greater the joy when that need is satisfied in Jesus. In our text this morning, Esther chapter 2 we see profound brokenness. It's a difficult mirror, this passage of scripture in Esther chapter two. We see regret. We see indulgence. We see the abuse of earthly power. We see the pursuit of earthly power. We see compromise. We see the objectification of women. We see sexual immorality and all in just 18 verses. The text provides a sobering picture of the brokenness that exists all around us and potentially inside of us. It's a lot to take in, a lot to process as the Lord uses this picture to press us, to ask reflective questions of our own heart, leading to, to think, are there elements of this brokenness in the text that are present in my life? Are there aspects of my life that are more in alignment with the kingdom of this world presented in Esther chapter two than the kingdom of our God? These are important questions for us to ask, important things for us to consider as we pursue faithfulness as the people of God. But what's more incredible, and here's what the joy comes in, friends, here's where our hearts should find delight, is that through Esther 2, we find more than brokenness. We also find the hope of Jesus Christ dripping off the page because this text is meant to remind us of a God who redeems all of this brokenness for his glory. You see, these questions aren't just meant to lead us to despair, but rather to rejoice and the wonderful ability of our God to redeem any brokenness, even if there are elements of our, of our life, even if there are elements of the sinfulness that we identify with. We also fundamentally believe that our God can, that he will take our missteps, that he will take our bad decisions, that he will take our failures and redeem them, turn them into something useful if we ask him to. If we come to him in humility and repentance, oh church, would you hear the promise of Esther 2 this morning? Yes, let's, let's come face to face with the brokenness here to let the word, Lord, Lord do work in our hearts. But let's also hear the overwhelming promise and be encouraged. God does not abandon us in our brokenness, but rather he delivers us for his redemptive purposes. He does not abandon us in our brokenness but he delivers us for his redemptive purposes. Let's read the first 18 verses of Esther chapter two this morning. Here's what the word of God says. After these things, when the king of uh, uh, King Ahasuerus had abated, the anger of the king Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Well, this pleased the king and he did so. And there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, 
the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure. She was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had, again, charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day, Mordecai walked in front of the court to the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go in to King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations of the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young woman went into the king in the way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in. In the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the term came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all of his officials and servants. It was Esther feasts. He also granted, and we all said amen, a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now, as you can see, as we read through this text, there's a whole lot of brokenness going on. I ask you to pray for me as I try to deal with all this in a family-friendly way. <laughs> we are a family-friendly program around here. But it's important for us to grasp the full picture that the Bible is painting here of this brokenness to consider how we are engaging it as the people of God. You know, sometimes we stand firm in the face of brokenness, but also there are times when we add to the brokenness that is all around us. And I want us to feel the weight of that. I want us to feel the weight of how we engage the brokenness around us for the glory of God even as we are led to the promise of the gospel, that, that God's grace and mercy are there to meet us in our moments of brokenness and redeem them for his glory. So let's begin our time this morning by looking at three realities of a broken world that are shown in our text to help feel the weight of the brokenness that, we are, that we're called to engage as the people of God. Firstly, in a broken world, we can make rash decisions that lead to regret. One of the aspects of brokenness that we see here in our, our text is that we can make rash decisions that lead to regret. As you may remember last week when Pastor Billy preached, Ahasuerus made a rash and drunken decision to summon his queen, Vashti, and then to remove her from that position when she refused to obey his drunken command. Since that time, Four years have passed. The king has waged an unsuccessful war against Greece, even though he assembled the greatest army known to man at that time. And this has left him vulnerable, likely embarrassed. Yet another crack in the picture of that so-called perfect kingdom that we saw in the beginning of Esther chapter 1. And as the king sits here on his throne, but in defeat, with need for comfort, he thinks about his queen. He thinks about Vashti and how he banished her. How he could not undo that banishment. His word was final and he regrets that action. You ever been there before? 
Ever been consumed by regret for a decision that you made in haste rather than bathed in prayer? I've certainly felt it in my own life. I remember years ago, I made a really bad financial decision with an auto loan. I had a, a car and it was, it was getting older, used, but I still had some, some money in the loan. And then the timing belt broke and the engine just blew up. And it was going to cost me five or $6,000 to get the engine replaced. And I said, you know what? I'll just trade it in and get a new car. So I'll take what's owed on my car, add it to a new loan, and then I'll get another used car. That was a really bad decision. And I, I, it took me years to crawl out from under it. And it hampered my ability to be generous in the way that God called me to be, even as a, a young man. Maybe you've made a, a, a small, hasty decision that led to regret. Maybe you've made larger decisions like Jephthah in Judges chapter 11. Do you remember this story, Judges chapter 11? Jephthah was a reluctant leader, a reluctant judge of God's people, and he was responsible for battling the Ammonites. And his, his desire to secure victory, he made a rash vow to the Lord. Here's what he, he vowed. This is verse 30 of Judges 11. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever or whomever, comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return from the, the peace, return in peace from the Ammonites, I will dedicate to the Lord and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Turns out the next thing that came through the door was his daughter. And even though it was an abomination to the Lord, he offered her in sacrifice. What about your story? Maybe you've made a rash decision and you're dealing with the consequences of today. Somewhere between a bad auto loan and sacrificing your daughter. Maybe you quit a job in frustration. Maybe you left a marriage in the heat of an argument. Maybe you said something to your son or daughter that has significantly changed your relationship and you don't know if you'll be able to get them back. Sometimes we make bad decisions. Sometimes we make rash decisions because we are imperfect knowers. And those bad decisions have consequences in a broken and fallen world, and they can lead us to be consumed with regret, wondering if things will ever be set right. And how we act in those moments matters. And in Ahasuerus's case, the way he acted leads to our second condition of a broken and fallen world. In a broken world, we can be ruled by sinful impulses that blind us to our true need. The Bible says in verse 2 that the king's young men, men who served the king in his royal court, offered him advice. As one commentator said, no offense to the, the students who are in our room, anyone who's been a young man knows that young men are not always the greatest source of wisdom. <laughs> and yet they come to Ahasuerus offering their wisdom. And how do they seek to, to comfort their king in the midst of his regret? Where do they encourage him to turn? Do they encourage him to repent? To be reminded of the fact that, hey, it was your decree, by the way, who put yourself in this position in the first place. They, they encourage him to take responsibility. No, their advice, find a new queen. Hey, trade in that old model and get a new one. Why don't you, to use that car analogy I had a minute ago. They propose to bring in young virgins from all over the empire to a harem in Susa from which the king should select a new queen. And much to our surprise, the king delights in this plan. And so without much thought, he executes their plan. I want us to notice something here that the author of Esther is, is bringing to our attention in both chapters 1 and 2. The author wants us to see the foolishness of this king as he is being used by so-called advisors to put into law whatever they advise in his weakest moments. Because that tendency, that, that action on weakness is what's going to lead to the people of God being in trouble later in the book. The king's pleasure is his ultimate goal. And as a consequence, their ultimate goal, those who give him advice. But listen, Feeding that pleasure in an earthly sense, especially in the midst of regret, does not serve Ahasuerus well. And it certainly doesn't serve the people of Persia well. And God's word is showing us here the dangers of turning to temporary gratification to heal what ails us. The act to indulge the king 
in his regret will not actually help the king. It simply feeds the brokenness of the king that will affect him even more, cause more regret, and affect more people. And in a way, the king is showing himself to be a servant, being ruled by his own impulses, manipulated by those who know those impulses and how to use them to get what they want. Wisdom, true wisdom would suggest that the king needs to find a new solution to deal with his regret, to deal with his brokenness, to deal with his favor. But instead, he keeps going back to the same well that will never satisfy. What a reminder to us, church, that sin will never ever be a true source of comfort to us. When we are in regret, we should not turn to sin to comfort because it will only lead to more regret in a broken and fallen world. Which leads to our third point. In a broken world, we can use God-given authority for our own pleasure rather than the common good. Ahasuerus was not the kind of guy you dream for your daughter to be with, especially after what he did to Vashti in a, a fit of drunken rage. And yet, once the king's edict went out, there was little choice in the matter for those who were under his rule. Young women from across the empire would be gathered into the king's harem, the place where the king's concubines would live. They would be prepared for the king in a process, listen, that took a full year. After that full year, they would sleep with the king one time, and unless he called for them again or made them queen, they would return to a different harem where they would live a life of what one author said was luxurious desolation. They were taken care of in terms of being fed a place to sleep, that they were abandoned with no potential to marry anyone else or have a family of their own or returning to their family. The brokenness of this act, the selfishness of it is stunning. It's clear that in this empire, people exist for the pleasure of one man. Pleasure that is ever-changing, fleeting, based on whatever counsel he's receiving at a particular moment and the consequences of his decisions, his rash unthoughtful decisions changes the course of lives. Now this use of earthly power, it should be noted, is not in accordance with God's design. It's a gross abuse of power. Government was designed by God to promote good and restrain evil, but this government is only concerned with one person's good. And when he is grasping at every earthly comfort to satisfy the deepest longing of, longings of his soul, everyone's at risk. God gives authority as a part of his creative design. He establishes authority in the home, in the church. He establishes authority in the social order for our good. But as with every good gift that God gives to us, we can misuse that authority to suit our own needs, to, to follow our own agendas, using up people created in the image of God along the way. We can climb over people at work. We can see people only as obstacles in the way of our, our power, objects for our pleasure. We can diminish others to make much of ourselves. And this grieves the heart of God. And it should grieve our hearts as well. And the final condition of brokenness that we see in this text is that in a broken world, we can choose to compromise our convictions rather than stand in faith. In Esther 2, we finally meet the two main characters of our book, Esther and Mordecai. And they are, there's no doubt that they are people caught between two worlds as they live in exile. This tension is reflected in the way that Esther is introduced in verse 7. She is Hadassah, that's her Jewish name, but she's also called Esther. That's a Persian name, likely connected to the Persian goddess Istar, who is the goddess of love and war. And as we see the events of chapter 2 unfold, you can't help but compare the actions of Esther and Mordecai with other exiles that we've encountered in the story of the Old Testament. For instance, think about the stories of Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or you may know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Daniel's three friends, 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were taken into exile under King Nebuchadnezzar. And there was a moment where King Nebuchadnezzar made this giant idol. And everyone who was around this idol, he called under his, his rule, under his authority, to bow and to worship this giant idol. And what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They said, no. Everyone else is going to bow, but we're going to stand. Even when they were threatened to be thrown into a fiery furnace, a fire in that furnace that was the hottest known to man, so hot it killed the soldiers who threw them in it. They said, King, you can do whatever you want to do. We're not bound because we believe that God can save us. And even if he doesn't, we're still going to keep our loyalty to him. And God miraculously delivered them, right? And they're thrown in the furnace and then the fourth person shows up. God is with them and protects them, sustains them as they stand in the face of social pressure to conform. Daniel himself, later in the story of Daniel, the book of Daniel, under King Darius, was ordered to stop praying to his God. Daniel refused. And as a result of that, was thrown into a den of hungry lions. But God shut the mouth of those lions. Until the exact right time when Daniel was delivered and those who conspired against him were thrown in to satisfy the hunger of those very same lions. When asked to compromise... Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they stood firm in faith. What happens in Esther is very different. And we got to see that. Mordecai does not resist the edict of this pagan king. He does not try to hide his cousin whom he had basically adopted as a daughter. He even tells her to hide her Jewish heritage. And Esther does not resist the call to, to flee the king or does not resist the call to the king's bed. Seemingly, she was seeking to please the king more than her God. And even as she hid her Jewish heritage, nothing in her actions, nothing in her actions as she served in the harem or served the king gave away the fact that she was part of a set-apart people. You see, the actions of Mordecai and Esther go against the expressed command of God to not physically engage pagans in this way, certainly not to marry them. Now, admittedly, we don't know the full disposition of Esther as she is escorted into the king, whether she was disgusted or excited, reticent or eager. But regardless, she and Mordecai do not resist as Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach did. The Bible does not pull any punches here. God's people are compromised in their exile. There have been times where they've stood faithfully, but there are also times when they forgot. They forgot who's they were, and they've chosen to pursue earthly pleasure rather than holiness. What about us? I imagine our stories are similar. There have been times where we've stood firm in the face of calls to compromise, but maybe there have also been times when we've fallen to the pressure to be conformed into the image of this world. We're like Peter. When pressed, we denied that we were ever associated with Jesus even as he stood faithfully in the court of man. Do you feel the weight of this passage? Do you feel the brokenness that it presents here, not only of the kingdom of Persia, but brokenness that still exists today? Let's allow ourselves to feel that way and ask the Holy Spirit to press in our hearts. Are any of the pictures that are painted here, as I look into the mirror of Esther chapter 2, is any of this true of my life? Am I, am I more conformed into the, the kingdom of this world than I am to the kingdom of God? Let's rest in that. Let's feel the conviction of that, even as this text points us to the hope and joy of Christ, as it leads us to unspeakable joy. Because remember, friends, the story of Scripture does not end with our brokenness. It ends with our victory as the people of God. It ends with set rightness in Christ. The Bible is exposing us to the brokenness of Esther's story and our own story to point us to the hope of the gospel, the joy of the person and work of Christ, where our brokenness is resolved, where true redemption is found. See, the gospel declares to us, that Jesus has come to set right all that was broken by sin. The regret in this passage, the relational strife, the abuse of power, the compromise, they're all tied 
to the initial rebellion of man that we read about in Genesis chapter 3, where an Adam and Eve choose to indulge in the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good of evil, rather than trusting in the word of God, that choice led to a curse. That choice led to the brokenness that we feel every day. But the promise of Scripture, the whole story of Scripture, is that Jesus is working to make all things new. He is working to reverse that curse, redeem that brokenness, and reconcile all things to God in himself. Let's consider for a moment how this text, with all of its brokenness, is actually preparing us to rejoice in the work of Christ. Because that is the purpose of Scripture to point us as we see our brokenness to the hope and redemption that can only be found in Christ. For instance, Esther chapter 2 reminds us that Jesus uses his power for our good. Let's think about the, the full work, the full person of Jesus this morning as we consider the brokenness of Esther 2 and consider that Jesus uses his power for our good. Think about it. He has the most authority. He has ultimate authority over all things. He is preeminent, as Paul writes in the book of Colossians. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. Having created all things, including you and me, he could have used us and his power to do anything that he pleased. Whatever was pleasurable to him. Yet, he did not. Listen to this promise of the gospel. He did not use his power to use us and cast us aside in some eternal harem. But rather, when we cast him aside, he allowed himself to be abused so that we could be saved. What a king. What a a God we serve who would use his power and authority in that way. More than that, this passage shows us that Jesus grants us unmerited favor. When I think about that statement, it probably brings me the most joy as I read this text. As I'm reading through Esther 2, I can't help but think about all that took place in the harem in verses 12 to 14. I would never, ever use this text for premarital counseling. <laughs> because look, I can't help but think about the pressure and the anxiety that built in these women as they prepared for 12 months 12 months to earn the favor of the king based on their performance on one night. They ate certain foods. They bathed in certain fragrances. They were given their cosmetics. They could even take things with them from the harem for the king, all in the hope that when they encountered him, they would be memorable enough for him to call on them again, or even more so to make them the queen. They didn't know what would happen when they entered And they had no assurance of what their life would be like after they left. What a terrible king. But Jesus is better. Jesus is so much better. He offers us his favor, not because of what we can do for him or what we have done. Not because of how prepared we are, how we have made ourselves worthy of him, but because, only because of what he has done. It's a stunning declaration of scripture, friends, that we need to rejoice in. We are unworthy, every fiber of our beings, and there's nothing we can do to make us more worthy of the favor of the king. And yet he generously bestows it upon us when we come to him in repentance and faith. Praise be to God. If you're feeling the pressure this morning of trying to work your way into the favor of God, if you think there's something you can do to make up that gap that exists between you and your creator, would you just reject that foolishness this morning and hear the promise of scripture that Jesus will bestow his favor, that if we are in the son, we will receive the favor of the father. Anyone who comes to him and repentance and grace will be made clean. There's no other way. There's no other way, but he will wash you water in the snow. He will make you worthy. So that then you can spend your life living in the favor that he has freely given, not trying to earn it. Thirdly, Jesus leads us to repentance in the midst of our regret. Another way this passage reminds us of the beauty of the person and work of Jesus. Jesus leads us to repentance in the midst of our regret. Jesus can redeem even our rash decisions for his glory and our good which is the truth that we got to cling to 
in the moments of our deepest regret. Think about all the terrible, terrible decisions that Ahasuerus has made just in the first two chapters of this book. And there are more to come, by the way. Let's blow the kingdom's resources on a crazy, indulgent party. Let's Let's banish the queen when she refuses my drunken request. Let's gather all the women, or, or many women, young virgins from all over the empire to help me feel better about myself. And yet God uses these decisions. He redeems them to accomplish something extraordinary, the salvation of his people. How many of us in this room would say, with the benefit of hindsight, that God worked in the midst of decisions that we regret to lead us to our salvation? How many would say that we can see how God redeemed bad decisions to lead us to him? I think about the funeral of my friend Warren Snyder. Many of you knew Warren, who passed away earlier this year. His wife, Mary, who's still a member of our church. At his funeral... A man got up to offer testimony about how the Lord used Warren in his life to lead him to Christ. This man was convicted of a violent crime. I think it was sexual assault. Is that right? And Warren was pastoring at the time. Somebody in his church knew of this man and asked Warren if he would go and visit him in prison. And so Warren did. Warren went and visited him and, and told him about Jesus and told him about forgiveness. And this man you know, thought that what he had done was too great. But what, what I've done, the forgiveness of God cannot cover. The grace of God cannot cover. And Warren just kept pressing and, and, and telling him, no, the gospel is greater. God's grace is greater. And eventually, the Holy Spirit got a hold of this man's heart. And eventually, the testimony of Warren grabbed a hold of him and in humility, he gave his life to Christ. And what's incredible now is that this man says, my job, what I do with my life as I go back into prisons, to talk to people who feel the exact same way that I did, that my, my, my decisions have permanently separated me from God. Like there's, there's no way he can redeem me. And to tell them, if God can save me, he can save you. So think about that. This, this man did something terrible, horrible. And yet God... God put him in a place where he was a captive audience to hear the gospel declared and God redeemed it not only to help him but to help others who have also made really bad decisions to come to a place of salvation. So maybe you've made some bad decisions in your life. You're not in jail, at least a physical one. Maybe you're in prison to your own impulses. Maybe you've tried everything to escape the regret by feeding those impulses but it keeps bringing you back to the same empty well. Would you come to Jesus today? He offers water that will cause you to never thirst again. Hear the wisdom of scripture, wisdom that is better than the wisdom of these young men. You need transformation. You need heart change. And the only way that you can be transformed, the only way you can experience true eternity altering joy is to give your life to Christ. God can use your regrets to lead you to a place of repentance. And finally, what's more is that not only can God redeem our moments of regret, Jesus redeems our moments of compromise to adorn his mercy and grace. Jesus redeems our moments of compromise, even as his people, to adorn his mercy and grace. Living in this world is tough. It is. It's just tough. We're called to be set apart, and yet we feel the pressure to conform. And the darker our society becomes, the more that pressure will build as the more we stand out, as we seek to become like Jesus. And sometimes we're going to stand faithfully like Daniel, Joseph, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And sometimes we're going to fall like Mordecai or Esther or, or David. We're flawed. We're not perfect. And while I hope that the, because of the Spirit of God living within us, and the power we have in him to be bold and courageous for the sake of Christ, I also want us to remember that that, that, that that will lead us to stand firm. I also want us to remember that there is grace and mercy in Jesus even when we fall flat on our face. Now, that's not an excuse to sin, right? What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. 
I don't want that to give you a pass or a license to sin. But in those moments, because we're not perfect and we're not in heaven yet, when we do fall flat on our face, there is mercy. There is grace. Maybe you didn't make the choice you should have at that party. Maybe you didn't say the right thing at work. Maybe you listened to that joke you shouldn't have. Maybe you weren't as bold as you should have been in that conversation. Just confess that before the Lord this morning. Don't live in the the shame of that. Confess. Ask the Lord to, to, to forgive you and give you boldness as you move forward and help help you be the kind of witness that honors him as you seek to tell others about Christ. And remember, God can even use our mistakes, our lowest moments for his glory and our good. Listen, while Mordecai and Esther did not know what was taking place, God did. And while there was probably another way, a more God-honoring way to achieve the same ends, God used even the shortcomings here to set in motion a, a plan to save his people. He used broken and flawed people to accomplish his redemptive purposes, as he did in the story of Jacob and Esau, when Jacob stole the birthright of his brother, and yet he's in the line of Christ. As he did in the story of David and Bathsheba, where God continued to honor the line of David, even after he murdered someone after committing adultery. Just go read the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 and see how many times God has redeemed broken, flawed people to bring about his redemptive purposes. If God can do that, then he can do that today. If God can do that in their story, he can do that in your story. If you have the humility to let him. So this morning, as we think about how to respond, can I just ask you two questions. Firstly, would you see the person of Jesus in all of his glory today and give him worship and praise? Jesus is a king who uses his power for our good. Oh, let's rejoice in that church. And Jesus is a king who grants us unmerited favor. What we could not earn, he has freely given to all those who have called upon his name in salvation. Praise be to God. Let's let's see the person of Jesus in all of his glory and give him praise. And then also, would you ask him to do his redemptive work in your life? Would you ask him to redeem your moments of regret? Maybe to salvation today. Maybe you've come in with a whole lot of brokenness and you've been drinking from a well that runs dry You've turned to those same old impulses and it keeps leading you to more and more regret. Would you come to Jesus today in repentance? Would you see that he is better? Would you see that he is better? You don't have to earn his favor. He will freely give it if you come in repentance and belief. And would you ask God to redeem your moments of compromise? To help you walk instead of partness? Maybe your story of receiving God's grace is the very thing that helps someone else see that their their story of brokenness is not beyond the reach of God's grace. Would you be faithful to say it? Faithful to tell it? Man, I messed up. I compromised. But let me tell you about the grace of God that's greater than my shortcomings. Because my life, my salvation, my standing before God is not about me. It's about him. And it's true of my story, it can be true of yours. Oh, that we would rejoice as the people of God, even in the midst of brokenness, and the work of redemption that God has provided us in Jesus. Amen. Wherever you are, you bow your heads. Consider for a moment how to respond to the preached word of God. Again, if you don't know Jesus, now is the time. Come in humility, come in repentance, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead to be saved. We'd love to receive you right here as we have some pastors coming forward. For the rest of us who are in Christ, how are we doing as a set apart people? Are we living in light of what Christ has done for us? Are we resisting the brokenness that is around us, are we adding to it? If it's a little bit of both, what do you need to confess today? And ask for God's help to be more bold for his glory. Father, we want to be more faithful 
because of our time around your word today. Thank you for your work of redemption. May we walk faithfully in it, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.